This is a full scale blueprint. Then I started to get concerned because it's an automatic. Will I be able to hook this to a manual? It's like, if you get to plant your flag in the moon, I guess your engineering was pretty good, but there's still gonna be somebody who goes, oh, the people at NASA are stupid. This car is super old school dangerous. You don't wanna crash it. What's up, people? We are back for the King Zero supercar build, uh, and now are the exciting dirty stages. I hope you guys will give me a little patience today as to not be showing you work. I'm gonna go over everything going on, but right now, Genius Garage is about to go test their IMSA Racing Corvette, so we've been working hard and get ready, and I'm gonna be testing, so didn't really have time for that. But let's go over, I wanna show you, because this is the ridiculous dirty stage of the build. I've got some of the giant full-size blueprints I've done here. Behind you is the BMW V12, so you're gonna see the engine. We're about ready to yank that out, and of course, here is what's left of the Boxster chassis. Now, there's a lot of parts sitting around. It generally looks like a bunch of garbage, and that's just part of the process. But if you want to come a little closer, I'll show you a bit about it. Now, this whole section in the middle has been cut away. No longer is there any worthwhile structural integrity the front of the chassis, but there is enough with regard to the, shall we say, frame rails of the unibody here and the bulkhead that comes up that ties into the subframe of the suspension. Also, I left on the sheet metal that basically holds the top of the McPherson strut you can see here. Now, truth be told, if I just come over here gently and bounce on it, you're gonna be able to watch this McPherson this whole tower flex. And that's because the integrity is gone, but I don't really care, because right now I just want this to all hold together. Lots of this is gonna be cut away, reconfigured, steel welded in place. And for everybody out there saying, hey, I should be putting in a chassis jig, I will say, hey, no I don't. Because what's left of the chassis still holds the subframe and suspension in the exact place it used to be. The only thing that can really change here is this flexing ever so slightly. So let's say the worst came to worst and it flexed a quarter inch here and nothing at all here. It really wouldn't matter because I'm gonna have adjustability in what we create with the top. So long story short, don't overthink it. This is still gonna be great. You can measure it and get everything square. Now, as a note, these seats sitting right here are not gonna be the final things in it, but I had them laying around. They are in fact back seats to an early 1990s Volkswagen Corrado. Yeah, we got random crap laying around. And weirdly enough, they sort of make bench seats that reflect what the, the King Zero needs to be. And as an example, your knees, the driver knees will be right about here at the trailing edge of the front wheels and your feet will be right here at the leading edge of the front tires. And for everybody going, hey, this car is super old school dangerous, you don't wanna crash it. I would say, yeah, you're right. And frankly, that's what makes it cool. And I really don't wanna crash any car, so I'm just gonna not. How about that? But anyway, so a lot of structure, a lot of welding that has to happen. I may go with lower profile front tires, but these seem to work in scaling. These are the stock McPherson struts, which we cut a bunch of links off the springs. We're not gonna use these just to get it low. I've got some awesome coilovers coming from Coilover Depot. Great site, you can order it for about any car you want. Loads of different coilovers, so check coiloverdepot.com. Big help there. I wanna show you guys this in a minute. This is the adapter plate for the V12, but I'm gonna show you this real quick on the 928 that will be my workbench. So check this out. This is a full scale blueprint. It's gonna be hard to see of the side view of the car. Now, if you look at it, maybe you'll have to hold it up high and look. In red, you can see the driver placement. I'm gonna slide it down a little. You can see in red the feet as they'll be effectively, look a little to the front, to your left. The feet as they are at the leading edge. You can see the McPherson strut, uh, illustrated there below the at Casey Putsch, of course, and the driver. Now, if you look back here, this was effectively of what the original car was. I blew it up to full scale with the wheelbase I will be creating. And I wanted to show you a lot of the differences that are gonna happen with my build of building a supercar, which I would consider a production version if the car were to evolve, and what the original inspiration was for this. The original car had a little uh, V4 engine. It was a compact four-cylinder engine out of the front of a Lancia Fulvia, which was a front-wheel drive car, put in the back. But as you can see, I got all this room from here to here for a bunch more cylinders. And we're gonna measure the V12 and I'm gonna show you how it fits real nicely. Obviously, it's an inline transaxle. Now, the original car, I'm gonna be honest, it was a beautiful styling exercise, had a lot of problems, two of which our driver visibility, that's, that's a big problem, frankly. And the other one is aerodynamics. This thing would be unstable at any higher speed because effectively it's an airplane wing 
that wants to take off. And what I mean to say is that big triangular opening that's at the top that's represented here was oriented in such a way that air was supposed to be drawn in through the top and then go out the back and the radiators were in the back from everything I can tell. There's a little bit of a scoop actions on the side, but effectively it would direct the radiators out the back. That would work kind of well because of a low pressure back here. But if you're drawing the air in from the top and going down, you're creating lift and turbulence. So in this, in my car, I will be directing air from below, much like how the front of, say, a Can-Am car or like a Chaparral in the 60s would get from, from the front, but I'm most likely going to put a radiator behind the driver in a compartment where it'll come in from below, it'll go through the radiator, through the engine bay, as in any typical front engine car, and direct out the lower pressure in the back. Uh, I will have room for twin fuel tanks, most likely, on either sides of the outside in the middle. It'll be a little safer. Uh, to be honest, I thought for a hot second of putting the fuel tank in, in between the front suspension, which, come on, let's go look at the car I tore apart. You go ahead and go over there, Josh. Just take a look. I legitimately thought about, for a hot second, putting the fuel tank there in that big hole where the original fuel tank was. Now, anybody would realize that, hey, that fuel tank is literally below your legs. Now, it worked okay for weight and balance and some things, but honestly, you'd potentially get fumes and all, and gosh, that is really making a bomb, isn't it? So I decided not to do that. Um, so the car, you, you want it to be reasonably safe, and uh, if the driver screws up badly to do something really stupid and hurts themselves, well, that's on the driver, i.e. me. But uh, I can at least engineer something that is sound and good, so it's not likely that I have a problem. And that's what good car design should be! And hopefully designers, you know, grow a pair in the future and make cool stuff. So in, in regard to growing a pair, instead of a lame four-cylinder engine, we're going to put a sweet German V12 in it. Now, as you guys may remember, this is a 1992 BMW 750 IL, which is a lot to remember. But anyway, I bought it for $1,300, the entire car. It runs. <laughs> it's decent. It, dry, it starts up every time. It idles beautifully. It runs good. It's got a fair amount of miles on it, but it's okay. It's leaking out of practically every orifice possible. Uh, actually, probably mostly just the valve covers, you know, the cam covers. But we'll seal it all up. The earlier motors, the M70, is similar to the architecture with what created the McLaren F1 later, although there was massive differences between those engines. Uh, but it's still a very nicely engineered engine, and it's going to sound beautiful when I make some tubular headers with megaphones and all 12 and a 6 and a 2 and a 1 and a 2. <laughs> It'll be cool. But a lot to do, and the other thing nice about having the radiator going to be in the middle of the car in front of it, I don't have very far to go to plummet, and frankly I can probably get a nice aluminum aftermarket radiator at Jegs or Summit, something like that for small block Chevys. It's going to have plenty of capacity, good price, great performance. So this engine's about ready to come out. Some of the positives for me utilizing this one, if you can see down here, here are the motor mounts on the side. They're nice cast aluminum pieces, real well triangulated and have these. So it's going to be very easy to fabricate the mounts for those, um, for implementing into the chassis. Now, if you will bear with me a second, I got to find a tape measure because I'd like to show you guys just how awesome this thing is going to fit. And we'll also take a look at the adapter plate. Now, to be perfectly honest, I'm going to tell you guys, I am a little concerned. My initial idea was, I know everybody's out there, build lots of power! Okay, for everybody that says build lots of power and twin turb skis and all that jazz, let me tell you guys something. That costs lots of money. So if I throw a bunch of power at this, I could probably buy, build two more cars for the price of just adding power to something that's already fast enough to put you in jail in all 50 states and kill you. So I'm just going to go with making a nice sound thing that's nice to drive, that sounds great, and it's a lot of fun. And so this car, I thought I could use the stock ECU and all. But today I realized, hey, this thing has fly-by-wire electric actuators for the throttle. Then I started to get concerned because it's an automatic. Will I be able to hook this to a manual and hook it all up and fool the motor into just running, and when you open the throttles and rev it, will it make power and allow me to drive it as a manual on the stock ECU? I actually don't know. So if there's anybody out there that works with the early 90s BMWs and the V12, which I hear is basically like the ECUs of two straight sixes, because you can see a distributor cap here and a distributor cap here, one for each bank, you got your uh, crank position sensor here. So I'm hoping that works because I don't really want to go standalone, but if you guys know a standalone, easy to program computer system that will work with the V12 where I can use if most, if not all of the stock components, 
that's a reasonable price, then that might be a really good way to go rather than dealing with dinking around with all this uh, electrical wiring harnesses. And I've never been a fan of electric throttle actuators because frankly, I don't trust anything electronic. I trust mechanical things a lot more, generally speaking, to not kill me. So let's measure the length of this engine here. I'm going from approximately where the bell housing of the transmission mounts to the back flange of the engine. Now I'm gonna go all the way to the front of the accessories. So right now I got 31 inches of full length here. If I just wanna to go to approximately the front engine, it's about 29 inches. So about two inches here. So let's just say 30 inches, okay? Give or take this engine's 30 inches long. Also, I'm gonna measure the approximate height of it. Okay, looks like we're, oh, 23 and a half. So 30 and 23 and a half, that's what we got, guys. All right, now let me move this giant thing. It's quite heavy. And I hope you guys will forgive the place being a dump. Oh, we just tried to get the race car out and there's crap everywhere. Okay, so take a look. Here is the Porsche Boxster Flat 6. Now, if I was a rational, normal human being, I would have just bought a Boxster that ran and hooked it up to run with what it's got because it's already got a drivetrain in there that runs. It'll make plenty of power. It'll be lots of fun. It's well balanced. It'll sound great. But I'm Casey Putsch, and apparently it's cooler to not do something to everybody, and I want to put a V12 in something that doesn't fit. So now, we said, what do we say? 31 inches of full length? So right here, you can see, is where, if you look at this plane here, where the transaxle mates to the back of the engine. That's right here, okay? And the Boxster engine to the front of the ancillary is rather short. It's only 20 inches. So what's amazing is from 20 inches to 30 inches, that's only 10 inches. I can fit another six cylinders in there. Boom! So here we go, 30 inches right here, guys. This approximate space right here, that will be the very front of the BMW ancillary spots. So if the BMW is right here, what's also interesting, if you notice where those motor mounts are, those coincide roughly to these bulkheads. So I can chop these bulkhead right about here I can cut out this whole area that I don't need, and we're going to have to bring this up. So if this is where the front of the engine is, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build la lateral support from this across here. I can also triangulate it in here, so we're still going to have great torsional rigidity. But if the front of the BMW motor is here, and this is where the seats are, and this can be a firewall that slopes up from below and creates a nice channel for the air to come from below, I have plenty of room to put a nice radiator in, in here, and hopefully some slim fuel tanks right in this area. I want to keep those fuel tanks low, and I'd like to keep them between the centers of the wheels. Obviously, it's great to put it right in the middle so that as your fuel tanks go lower, it doesn't upset the balance of the car. If you have the tanks in the back or the front, as you fill them and lower it, it, ups, it changes the balance of the car. So if I can get them here, that'll be really nice. Obviously, I want to have my radiator have it all nice and compact. Now, what's also cool, the design of the top of the car is the giant triangular opening. So if approximately right here is the back of your head, the driver's head, that means that's where the firewall is. Now, if I recall correctly, the front of the triangle comes to approximately here in the middle. And your windshield starts from about here. Now, this is the rear, rear edge and goes down, 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 way down to practically your feet. And then you have your side windows, which is the reason why this stuff will have to be cut out. There's going to be big tubular structure right here in the center, close to the styling queue. Also give you side impact. It's going to be up here because there's no, there's no doors on the side opening. So I'll be able to create a lot of structure. Unfortunately, the weakest part of the car is where the windshield slash door is. Um, so needless to say, you really don't want to get in the front end accident or have somebody crash and drive road over top of you. But I think of that sort of thing. So if somebody were to drive over top of you, you want to make sure you have some really great structure in it so it would deflect whatever car up and over and away from you. Probably like something you see in Grand Theft Auto with a giant cow catcher that's just obliterating any, everything. But that's not, not the goal here. <laughs> Anyway, so I just want to show you guys that I'm pretty excited. It's going to be about there, but I am forgetting one thing, the thickness of the adapter plate. So let's go ahead and add another two inches to it to be conservative. That puts us at about 32 inches. That's still right here. There's plenty of room to do the rest of the things you need to. So I am really excited about that. It's going to be fun to cut it out. Of course, you got to get that engine out and clean it up. And what was the other thing I was going to show you? Something cool. Um, of course, we got the shifter. It's remote. It's going to have to be moved way up there. I'm going to have to put in a different steering rack. Uh, I'm going to go with a manual one and uh, side with, no, don't want the side. Cut away with driver. Just did that one. Where the heck's the other one? Oh, it's up there. All right. Oh, and the adapter kit. Let's look at that real quick. So this was done by a man down in Texas. He does some things for kit cars. And I came to learn that these VM v BMW V12s are popular for people that want to make Lamborghini kit cars. That's not really my scene because 
if the amount of time it takes to build a Lamborghini Git car, you could just apply that to a job and probably buy a Lamborghini. So I, you know, I was never really into that scene. I kind of want to rather build my own car. I do like some replicas, but I'm not knocking it. It's just kind of the way I look at it. So anyway, here's my hardware. Looks like some pretty nice stuff. Got some nice big Allen bolts for the flywheel. Here is the pressure plate, which is uh, for Porsche. I'm waiting on the center friction disc. But here's the adapter plate that mates the BMW uh, M70 V12 engine to the Boxster transaxle. And if I'm not mistaken, this one has just been designed so it can utilize the stock BMW starter, which bolts on here, right here. Where the heck does that bolt on? That's weird. No, it bolts on here, goes through like that. Yeah, that makes sense. So presumably this bolts right here to the BMW and then this outer part BM bolts to the transaxle. I could be wrong, but that seems to make sense in my brain right now. Maybe I'm backwards. Either way, this is the adapter plate. So there's that. Now, the one thing that I'm not super keen on, I'll be honest, when you're adapting something that's not exactly made to go together, I think it's gonna be all right. The flywheel on this is a little long and it's a little heavy. I could always have some weight taken out of it, but since it is a V12, it'll run real smooth. It'll still make good power. It doesn't have to be insanely snappy. This isn't a Formula One car, but um, looks like it's been machined quite well. Obviously it's steel. It's got the locating pins here to put the pressure plate on. And the pressure plate will bolt to the top of this. So that will actually sit right here on this. And uh, the friction disc will go in here and ride against the surface. They've already pressed in a nice uh, pilot bearing here. And of course that bolts onto the back of the Beamer. Now, some of you smart people out there are saying, well, Casey, there's no ring gear on there. And I will say, you're right. The BMW is an automatic, so it has a flex plate on the back, which is relatively thin, lightweight, big ring gear. So you actually take the flex plate, knock some things off of it, and it gets sandwiched between, and you start it off the flex plate and utilize this. So I'm hoping this is well balanced. Um, it works well. I, I might go so far as to take this flywheel and send to a shop to static balance it, because I don't see anything on here. It looks like it was balanced. Um, and since it sticks out, you know, a lot of flywheels, like here's your output flange of your crankshaft and the flywheel is largely on plane. This one comes out a lot and is out here. So if it were all, all out of balance, it would magnify that and flex with the crankshaft. Don't want to do that. Don't think it'll be too much of an issue, but just want to make sure it's perfect, even though I am doing kind of a budget build. Um, and that's, that's sort of that. So, but on the plus side, it is a V12, it is well balanced, it is a BMW, there's virtually no vibrations and people do do videos of putting a nickel or a coin sitting right here on the engine cover with it idling and revving and it doesn't fall over because there's so few vibrations. So I think we're gonna be okay. I know a lot of armchair engineers out there like to overthink everything. And I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of comments from, oh, I don't know about your suspension geometry. If it's lower that much, that's too much negative camber. Your structural rigidity is wrong. What kind of welding are you gonna do? Oh, the frontal impact, that's dangerous. Yeah, I know, <laughs> that's cool. Well, the V12, what are you gonna do for mounts? The cooling, the aerodynamics, ah, oh, that's cool. Okay, just relax, I can build a car, it'll be good. You can build one too. Uh, I appreciate you guys being interested enough to say, but as we all know, it is funny to listen to armchair engineers once in a while. Um, it's sort of, here's the deal guys. So the armchair engineer, let's go look at the V12. This is a great saying somebody told me, right? So this is it, what is all considered a ratty old V12 and a BMW that frankly no one would want to restore. If you had to restore this car, first of all, it's a $1,300 car you would have to take all this crap apart and fix it up. And this, this doesn't make your loins burn like a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or anything cool. It's just an old BMW, just get a new one. The best thing you can do is use the V12 for something cool. That's the way I look at it, right? Just the end. But you know the engineers that get way too detailed about something? Like the way I look at it is let's engineer to accomplish something and win. It's like if you get to plant your flag in the moon, I guess your engineering was pretty good, but there's still gonna be somebody goes, oh, the people in NASA are stupid. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? And my, I will leave you guys with this last thing. There was something saying that the armchair engineers are posed with a problem. And then you have somebody else, maybe somebody like me that isn't. And the problem is this, it's a theoretical thing on paper for engineers. And the engineer is there and there's a beautiful woman across the room that you'd love to dance with. And they say that every time you get to go up to the beautiful woman, you only get to transverse half the distance to the woman. 
And the engineer quickly realizes, I can't, I'll never get there. It'll always be infinitesimally small. It's an impossibility. I can never get to the woman. And then everybody else who's a racer just gets things done to build thing goes, I can get close enough. <laughs> All right, guys, hope you're enjoying the build and I'll see you next time.